everybody. Thanks for joining me for another One Man Review. Today I'll be taking a look at two works by the artist Ivana Filopovich. The first book here is Where Have You Been? Ivana Filopovich is a Balkan artist who was active in the comic scene there for uh, a good amount of time. So you get this collection, which is a bunch of short stories that were published, I guess, in Balkan comic magazines from 1995 to 2000. And then you get a second chunk of comics that uh, picked up in 2017. So at some point, it, from the biographical information in here, Ivana moved to Canada and was working at a university and is now back to doing comics. So has collected them and I'm assuming translated them, but I don't, I don't know. There wasn't much information about the artist in, in the book. Uh, this, so there are a bunch of short stories. Uh, I'm going to go through and just sh not even go through all the stories, but just show little pieces that I like, the things like that. This first one, Overture, I mean, right out the gate, grabbing me with the art. The art in the first chunk here really reminds me, for some reason, I get a lot of th this story in particular, not so much. But I see a lot of Guido Kripa in that there's a lot of characters wearing like really fashionable clothes and things like that. And then something about the line work and the compositions remind me of his his work a little bit. I don't know what the influences would have been on Ivana, but that's the artist that I see. And then this story, I think, also shows like a kind of Eddie Campbell from uh, from from Hell vibe. So again, I don't know if those are influences at all, but those are the two reference points I can think of that the art kind of reminds me of. This first story here, Overture really opens the book strong. I really like it and it gives a sense of when Ivana's at her best with the writing, she can show these really kind of complex social situations with a lot of characters moving about doing things. Uh, it, you kind of have to catch up while you read, but it's it's something you can catch up with as you read. And I really like that approach to the writing. This one here starts with uh, this woman coming into her booth at the opera and she's coming in supposedly during the overture and then very quickly jumps to uh, what looks like stuff that's probably happening on stage like a scene in a play because you have the audience here watching but you very quickly figure out that what you're watching is actually everybody in their costumes already in the sets and everything backstage looking for this cat and it almost has like a Shakes when Shakespeare writes comedy you know, you have all these characters coming and going off stage and things going awry. It has that feeling, but now it's all happening backstage. But it, you get a sense that this is also, you know, could be a play itself. It has that kind of pacing and writing and humor in it. So I really enjoyed that one. And then that, again, at some point cycles back out to the audience. So just an interesting structure of storytelling in that one. And you can see the art here is just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, all of this stuff really to me this pen and ink work just really really stands out this story is called Marilyn uh, most of these are really short like anywhere from two to five pages or so some of them are a little longer like overtures a little longer I think I like the longer ones a little bit better because uh, Ivana is so good with the social situations but some of them like this one Marilyn I think She's really able to land a, a whole story within a few pages, which is which is nice. It's really cool. Uh, but you can see, again, the drawing here. This is where I see a little bit more. Just the way the, the figures are drawn. I see some of that Guido Kripa and just some of the taller, longer panels and compositions. But this is about a, this guy asks out a, a girl who's nuts and everyone's warned him against her. And I, I really like this scene here where she starts a fight and he realizes he's made a mistake and so he tries to take her out in the middle of their date he tries to take her out with the chair and she just assumes that he was trying to help her out and missed so it's just these little social situations i think seem to be uh, of biggest interest to ivana filipovich as a, a writer and they, they will also veer into like surrealism sometimes but it's usually grounded character driven work Here's another one that's like a silent story, and this is, is another one of those where I saw the Kripa influence, again, with the long, tall panels, the lengthy, thin women, uh, women wearing like really nice fashion with patterns on them and using those patterns to create black and white rhythms. So those are all things I really enjoy. Uh, unlike with Kripa, I can actually enjoy reading Ivana Filipovich's stories, so that's really cool. 
Uh, here's one where I just really, really like the art. This this one's a bit of a surreal story, and it, it's really short, so I don't want to talk about what it is because it's pretty funny. But it's a it's a these two statues wind up talking to each other and having a really fun conversation. But you, you can see that as the style's consistent throughout. Uh, she can navigate like very old subject matter and very kind of hip modern subject matter. Uh, I guess these are being made in the 90s, so they don't come across as so modern anymore. The style oftentimes feels very, I think that's the other reason I see creep on here is it feels very mod, feels very like 60s mod to me, a lot of the style choices. But to be able to flip from that to like this Gothic cathedral and have the same approach but such different subject matter, I think, is also really impressive. The longest story in this book shares a title with the other book that I'm going to re review, and it's coming in the mail, which is why I don't have them both out at the same time. But this one is called What Does Fear Have to Do With It? The one that's on its way, 64 pages. This one's 30 pages. So I'm really curious to see, and you, I guess to you all, you'll find out immediately because these will be in the same video, but I'm really curious to see how this story gets updated. This was supposedly written in 1999, but there's some weird things here where, like, this character's asking to have some photos taken for her social, and they reference Netflix and Instagram and stuff, so uh, I think probably what's, what's happening is that this is a story that's getting expanded and updated, and so some of the dialogue has been updated to feel more modern. But basically what it is is you have a... a few different characters and I'll get more into it I'm assuming it's the same story so I'll get more into that with the review of the full book but you have a, basically a love triangle with a mobster guy and kind of his friends and some of the girls and they're all at the club and you have all these characters cycling uh, against each other and they're, they're almost like it's almost it, it feels a bit like a and the same thing with the overture one at the beginning of the book it almost feels like a, a movie that's shot with just one camera scene and so characters come and go but you always have like one character threading between them that's not exactly what it is you know there's jumps and time and things like that but it it has that feeling of like just being passed off from one character to another as you know you get passed on to this person and you'll follow them till they meet someone and, and then they cycle back around to each other so it's a really interesting style of writing it feels much more literate I, I don't know how novelistic i guess how to say it but again character driven down to earth kind of stuff and so i really like it and you come into the scene you come into the scene and leave the scene you know in the middle of these characters lives so it's not like you're getting all the information you can piece it together but it's not to the extent that it's frustrating where you can't keep up either it, it takes a second to get going but it's interesting and you can see that same like really delicate scratchy art where there's none of the blacks are filled in black they're like scratched in with little hatch marks uh, it, uh running in a more kind of contemporary like i said more art mod, mod type of looking art but yeah here uh the characters mentioning netflix and then in, in this one the character says you saw it on my instagram uh most of the story centers around this coat that that this guy is buying for people. So I, I enjoyed that story and I'm really curious to see how, how it pans out over a, a larger book. And especially if it's something that was made in 1999 and the author's coming back to it now, I'll be really curious to see how those two things changed with, with maturity, you know, someone grew older. This is a series of shorts called My Neighborhood and they're just characters that I'm assuming were actually people that Ivana Filipovich saw around and then extrapolated stories about, but they might be real. They feel a bit extrapolated, like you see the person around and wonder who they are, what became of them. Like this one is talking about a girl who really tried to be like the perfect wife and then the the kind of imaginative part, I think, is the, assuming that she went over to Austria to be a prostitute after her heart got broken. Uh, this one here is a, about an old woman who's just trying to outlive all of her husband's <laughs> mistresses. So th they have this like quirky little, it feels like a writer. I, I don't know. I feel like I do this too. I'll see someone and I'll, I'll know a little bit about them and I'll want to fill in their story. That's how this feels to me. Uh, I really like, <laughs> like this right here as a bit of writing and as an insult. 
this that's what this character is is someone who never really speaks but if he does it's always just brutal so here he says next time if you really need to release some air just fart it would be so much more substantial so rather than like talking to me i'd rather just smell your smell your fart <laughs> that's a, i'll have to keep that for if someone really irritates me um then there's a gap where apparently the author was working in a college dealing with like arts and education, something like that. This little bit here in the middle is a chunk of illustrations that were done for Ivana Filipovich's Instagram. So this is for, for Inktober in 2018 and just uh, portraits of female artists that she enjoyed. She says when she had to find 31 female artists. She realized that most of her idols were men, which I think is an interesting, interesting statement in there. And so she was having trouble finding the 31 females that inspired her, uh, but she, she found them apparently. So I had to go through and just kind of note the ones that I know. You have Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, Hilma Af Klint, and then I, it was really nice to see uh, some contemporary comic artists. So here we have um, Jillian and Mariko Tamaki, whose books I love, and I'm really looking forward to their their new book coming out from Drawn and Quarterly. But this one, Summer's, you know, probably one of my my favorite books of the last however many years since it came out. So then you get a real jump in style here, also that carries over into the new comic work, where you can see that it's like ink with uh, washes, or oftentimes like a gray paint. I don't, some of these look like they might actually have color to them, but they're being represented in black and white. I'm not sure. And then as you get into the later work, it looks like it's being done digitally as well. But I think it's a really interesting look here to have, like, instead of a ink wash or a tone or something like that, to be using like a gray gouache or a gray acrylic or something like that because uh, of the way it's catching the, the tooth of the watercolor paper and creating a dry brush in a way that a wash wouldn't. So it has that same textural quality as the black ink does. And I think that's a really interesting look. That is employed here in this story, which is about, I'm assuming it's an autobiographical one. It's presented that way, uh, but it's called My Former Boyfriend. And it's about the author uh, being asked to do some comics or is going to be some submitting a comic saw a call for comics about surviving dictatorship and is having memories of living in a dictatorship in her youth and a boyfriend that got beat up um, and put imprisoned and forced to sign a confession even though he really wasn't up to anything uh, it, you know it's just eventually they beat him into submission and he, he signed this confession so you know put, putting it from a really personal standpoint and juxtaposing that to uh, a Wikipedia entry or something found online that's about how to live in a dictatorial dictatorial regime and, you know, kind of seeing you know, the reality of it versus the theoretical implication or the theoretical suggestions. It's really like that, that it's always brought down to the personal. This story here uses, this is more of a story about uh, just the local mythology that she grew up with, it seems like. And this one's done in pencil. Uh, there's kind of a reminder of like Kathy Kolowitz and some of the like this figures here that are used as the frontispiece for the story. Very like Goya or Kathy Kolowitz kind of expressive rendering with the pencil. I, I really enjoy that. You know, these characters here kind of feel Goya to me or Kolowitz a little bit. A little bit of Will Eisner in there too. Uh, I've never thought about that before, but he's kind of the ink version of that vibe. And then here you get a return to uh, being like at an opera or a theater again. So kind of going back to the setting of Overture in the opening, which is interesting. And some very like fancy gowns and it feels more old again. But uh, a really interesting story still where someone is uh, trying to... they some, a man comes up and introduces himself as someone who used to know this woman and she thinks it's like just a pickup line and then goes on to realize that she did know him. So it's it's really compelling story. And then again, you get a look at like the ability to employ this much more calligraphic style. I think this is di done digitally. It looks kind of digital, but mimicky that like paint, paint and pencil charcoal look kind of thing. 
uh, but going from these really elegant, beautiful kind of renderings of the opera to a very much more like patterned mod type of art style here. And again, with that very expressive kind of calligraphic touch to everything. So really, it's the real variety of stuff, and I really enjoy that. And then there's this uh, Maurice in the middle, which seems to be a, like an ongoing thing that's on Instagram from the COVID lockdown, and they're just focused on the cat. Remind me of, uh, of Carl Stevens' book, Penny, where you kind of always seen everything through the eyes of the cat. But it's just discussions. I don't know if they actually happened or how accurate they are, but it, it seems like probably things that actually came up and then seeded ideas for a story. It doesn't seem totally autobiographical or true to reality, but there's some really interesting, funny dialogue in here. Uh, there must be an easier way to kill each other than to start a home improvement project. Why do we even do this? So we welcome this post-apocalyptic world readily. And it, <laughs> it's just that that kind of stuff like where it's the dr the high drama of living together with someone for a long period of time, which I, do, you don't usually see addressed in comics. I've been looking, you know, I've been looking around and being really frustrated at how many it's like one out of every four ads I see for a comic or a description for a new comic is like a coming of age story. And it's like, fuck, how many coming of age stories can we have? Uh, you know, but I think a lot of artists are making their work when they're young and then they, they die out. It's hard to maintain a career. So it's really nice to see someone coming back, obviously more mature and dealing with the situation of like people who have lived together, living together during the lockdown and like you know we really want to take on a new home improvement project and this one here uh i'll just read it and it says to be continued but it's not this is the end of the book so i guess spoilers i'm giving away the end of the book but it's to be continued so i just really like the dialogue here uh, i fear what's next for us i can vision a two-class society of just ultra rich and super poor huh my concerns are mostly around not being able to lick my fingers and having to use a spoon to eat peanuts. So, you know, like as we're in this shutdown phase of the pandemic, the different things that people would worry about. And this very much feels like a conversation that me and Tori would have where I'm I'm like the paranoid conspiracy theory worried about the big picture. And especially lately, because she hasn't been able to leave the house in a year now. We've hit the year anniversary of COVID still keeping her housebound. Um, you know, you have the very real earth concerns of like, I just want to, I want to be able to use my hands to eat stuff. And then it keeps going. Collapse of democracy, suppression of free thought, attacks on education and information sharing, modernized slavery by the way of constant Big Brother style monitoring. Come to think of it. I'll have to use a spoon for everything. It's a disaster. I feel like my manners will need a serious shift. I already detest with my entire being. Imagine all of us behaving like deranged aristocrats, eating fruits with forks and knives and trying hard not to touch each other, except with gloved hands. We will need modern Robin Hoods instead of Batman or Iron Man characters. I don't want to subsist on powdered shakes. When you get out of the food concern phase, we can talk about important issues like superheroes. So I just find that like great dialogue. Uh, this is the kind of stuff I really crave in, in my books now. Comics is this kind of thoughtful, down to earth, like good ear for dialogue. Uh, the, the only person I can kind of think has the similar vibe in, as some of these later pieces is Eddie Campbell. The way he has that very humorous but dry like down to earth dialogue, but like really educated dialogue as well. Um, someone who's well read and stuff like that. So I, I really, really enjoy this work. Uh, I wish, I, I'm assuming this is the entirety of what Ivana Filipovich has produced over the years. It doesn't seem like comics were her career. So I wish there was more and I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing how the, the work works in just a, a big chunk when we get that second book in that seems to be an expansion of the story in here. Um, so w that will show up immediately next in this video, but I'm, I'm looking forward to that and hopefully there's s some success here. It seems like she's become reinterested in comics and I think this is a voice we could very, very much use right now. So really excited about it and let's see what the next one's about. Okay, so I got the expanded version of what's fear got to do with it and the man was able to read that and 
Um, I'm now way less confused about the story, but I'm much more confused about why this was presented in a truncated form in the like anthology version of short stories. It was presented as like a 30 page short story that seemed like it was supposed to be presented as complete. Now it seems to me like they just chopped the first half of it off and gave you the ending without the context, which is why I felt that it was very surreal. I thought it was happening in a nightclub. Um, I didn't quite understand who any of the characters were. The place that they introduce you to the characters in, they're kind of all the core of the characters are already split up, so you don't understand their relationships the way you're supposed to. So I thought it was like a strange, surreal story, but really it's a very down-to-earth uh, story about just like interpersonal relationships, especially this like triad relationship here. It's a polyamorous relationship between this character Max and his two girlfriends Mia and Eva. Max is some kind of thug. He's like a heavy for a loan shark. I, at some point in the book it looks like he shoots somebody and kills them. Um, so he's got that kind of like gangster money and then he's got these two girls, Eva's, you could you could see Mia's like the one that's loudly dressed and very kind of aggressive and outgoing and sexual. So it seems like she's kind of the side slice, the, the fun side slice. And then Eva's like the, the long term, you know, she's the one that's down for the long term and more emotionally supportive or something like that. He trusts her more. And uh, that, that's kind of the core of the relationship. The, the girls don't seem to have any interest in each other. They just seem to be tolerating each other. Like here, you know, he's saying no more cat fights. I'm sick of it. So he's definitely using his money to kind of be pulling these two girls. I don't think they have any interest in each other. Uh, then the core of the story, which I did pick up on in the, the smaller version, the shorter version, is that there's a coat that they're both interested in, a very fancy coat. And that's mostly Mia is saying, you know, my birthday's coming up. When am I going to get this fancy coat that you, you've been promising me? Um, and that's that's causing a lot of the argument between them. And so you, you get that. You get this them in this night market walking around and these events unfolding that eventually will like undo their relationship. Um, here you get a sense that also, Eva, even though she's supposed to be the steadier one of the two, is actually up to something behind his his back. Uh, I think what she's doing is she's getting him to buy her all these nice fancy clothes, and then she's pawning them to try and build up money for herself to, to get something uh, for herself. So there's that, or she's trying to help someone that's getting a plastic surgery. Um, so she's kind of running a scam on him and is actually not as steady as he wants her to be. Here you get the scene where it, I'm pretty sure this is Max coming out from under the car and he shoots a guy here. Uh, the With the drawing style, this it, it's... And I'm pretty sure this like piece put on the front wasn't something that was done more recently since there's a big gap in between when this story seemed like it was originally released and, you know, like that... that the collection of short stories is like, here's the early part of my career, there's a big 10 some odd year gap, and then now I'm making comics again. The style looks very, very different in the second half of the book, and this is too consistent all the way throughout. There's still something Guido Crepa about it to me. Um, I just can't imagine an artist going back and nailing their earlier self so accurately, and the story is so cohesive all throughout as well that this just seems like for some reason they stuffed it into that book in a half version i don't know why they gave the later half rather than the first half because you're kind of giving away the end of the story without giving any of the setup so i don't know that that's kind of strange um, but there is because of the scratchy style sometimes i do have a hard time tracking some of the characters and i'm relying on their clothes more than their faces so i think that was max killing someone but because he's in these different clothes, I'm not quite sure there. Uh, then you get introduced. This is kind of where the, I think this is where the short story starts here, where you're just getting these non-main characters. They're like secondary characters that help drive the story forward. 
but you get uh, Martin and Sandra. Martin is, this is Martin, the guy in the puffy jacket, and then Sandra's this girl with like the Charlie Brown shirt on. Um, M Martin is Max's old friend and he owes him money, but Max is not like beating the shit out of him because they're old friends and people are wondering like how he's getting away with that. This scene where Sandra and Martin are going around in, I still think it's a club or it's at least a dance party happening in the, the night market. Uh, they stumble into, I think the murder scene. This was one part that's a little unclear with all of the word bubbles and again, the scratchy style, there's uh, there's some lack of clarity in the background here. And I think what's being suggested is that this is actually the murder scene, you know, with the bullets in the hole. But again, it like seeing these characters, uh, you know, it's there. there's not much of the murdered people to like compare them to the guy that got shot earlier. But they're talking about it as like, oh, this is this art installation. And that's why I was getting this like really bizarre, surreal vibes of these characters in this weird nightclub with this art installation of dead people. But yeah, I think the implication here is that they actually stumble into the murder scene and they just think it's the new art installation. Um, so there is, even as much as I like the book and as much as I like the art, there are sometimes some just framing issues or, you know, the artwork doesn't lend itself to really clear recognition of characters sometimes. And so you get these ambiguities that make it seem like a more surreal story than it really needs to be. Uh, here, and I guess this is going to be pretty spoilerly because I want to compare it to the earlier release. Um, here now it's much more clear to me that not only is Martin not paying Max back, but he's also one of the people or the person that, that Eva's been interacting with to pawn the clothes off and get the money. And um, you, get the, you get the realization that he's also uh, cheating on Max or Eva's cheating on Max with his old friend Martin who owes him money. So then that builds to like a culmination and I won't spoil the rest of the book, but you get this big culmination of how that breaks their relationship apart and what what Max's response is, what Mia's response is, and how the characters move forward from there. And all of that's much more clear. You know, now we're 38 pages in. Um, the At least the first, yeah, 20, 25, 26 pages are missing. And I think, you know, I haven't gone and done a page by page comparison, but I think probably a couple at the end or a couple here and there in between are missing as well because this is a, let's see, 58 page book. And I think there was about 30 pages. So there's like, yeah, there's like about 25 pages or something missing. And I, I don't know why they did that because it really did a disservice to the story. It's actually a really interesting story, really well written, very literary. There's a couple points where I was a little confused about what was going on just because the, the, a lot of the text heavy stuff blocks some of the already um, difficult to interpret panels that made some of the specifics of the story a little hard for me to understand. But overall, like I enjoyed it much better in this version. And I do think this is a really nice book. I hope that Ivana Filipovich now, having come back to comics, has something else longer form, not just these shorter stories that are in the collected version, but something else longer form because as a writer, I do think she's very powerful and working with more adult topics and in a very literary style. Uh, it would be interesting to see what the new, like, computer rendering style that she has, how that all works out. I think maybe the art would be, you could put color and stuff like here that would be helping the audience follow the characters a little bit more or so, something like that. So really compelling work overall. Um, I definitely would recommend both books and an artist and writer, creator that I hope, uh, you know, has more to say because it's very interesting stuff. House on Fire by Matt Battaglia is a just gorgeous book where Matt's kind of making an emotional response to the the years of COVID and wrapping that into a sci-fi dystopian future that really the sci-fi dystopian's backgrounded and you're fo focused on the emotional journey of two characters in a really beautiful way. 
And then that's enhanced by Matt's like really awesome, loose, kind of Paul Popish um, dry brush work. And then Sean and Matt have worked to get this second kind of orange spot color in there that's going to look really, really beautiful. And it has allowed Matt to use his dry brush technique to add tone to the thing too. So um, with Sean's production technique, this is going to be a gorgeous book with a lot of heart. Make sure to like, smash that subscribe button, and ring that bell.